Looking for a Christmas gift for the Cold War aficionado in your life? Do check out loads of gift ideas, including our wide range of Cold War themed mugs and our store. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store for more details or look in your episode notes. Now, back to the episode. And I only discovered again in 1990 that this building used to belong to my mother's family and that this building was where her grandfather had jumped out of during a torture session to escape basically torture. And so he'd killed himself by jumping off this building. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Leia Ippi grew up in one of the most isolated countries on Earth, a place where communist ideals had officially replaced religion. Albania, the last Stalinist outpost in Europe, was almost impossible to visit, almost impossible to leave. It was a place of queuing and scarcity of political executions and secret police. To Leia, it was home. People were equal. Neighbours helped each other and children were expected to build a better world. There was a community and hope. Then, in December 1990, a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall, everything changed. Almost overnight, people could vote freely, wear what they wanted and worship as they wished. There was no longer anything to fear from prying ears, but factories shut, jobs disappeared and thousands fled to Italy on crowded ships, only to be sent back. Predatory pyramid schemes eventually bankrupted the country, leading to violent conflict. As one generation's aspirations became another's disillusionment, and as her own family secrets were revealed, Leia found herself questioning what freedom really meant. Leia has written an engrossing memoir called Free, Coming of Age at the End of History. There's links in our episode notes showing you how to buy the book and every purchase will help support the podcast. Now time doesn't come free and I'm asking listeners to support my work recording these incredible stories via a small or large donation. If you become a monthly supporter via Patreon, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. You can also make single donations as well. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Leia Ippi to our Cold War Conversation. I was born in 1979 uh, in Tirana. I lived in Duras, which is actually on the Adriatic coast in Albania. But because it was a difficult birth, my mother was sent in the capital because they had more equipment there. And um, she was able to deliver in Tirana. So my official place of birth is Tirana, even though I lived (laughs) all my life in, in Duras. Yeah, I understand there was some uh, doubt as to whether you were going to survive even. Yeah, I was given 30% chance of survival. So, well, well, we're delighted that you made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what what did your parents do? My father was a forest engineer and my mother was a maths teacher. But none of them had actually studied what they wanted at university. Um in fact, people who came from families like theirs, many of them the ones who went to university a decade or so later didn't even manage to actually go to university. The ones who were ready to go to university didn't even even manage. So they came from um, families with what was called a bad biography. (laughs) And uh, that meant that they were on the wrong side of class struggle in communist Albania. And people who had bad biographies, there was always obstacles to them studying and to studying what they wanted. Usually they were discouraged or not allowed to study humanities because the people who studied literature or history or journalism tended to be people who were coming from families that were loyal to the party. And so if it wasn't, if you didn't come from a family of party members, and if you came from a family with a bad biography, then you weren't allowed to study at all, or you weren't allowed to study what they wanted. It depended a little bit on 
the stages of Albanian history and where um, how the party was coping with external forces and also internal power struggles. So when my parents studied, they were able to study because this was the period in which Albania was still in an alliance with the Soviet Union and communism was kind of a little bit softer. And, uh, and so they could study, even though they didn't choose what they studied. They were just given degrees. They were assigned things. Wow. Wow. And, and, and yeah, because with Albania, it went through various phases of, of different influences, initially with Yugoslavia, then with the Khrushchev thaw in the Soviet Union, there was that uh, Soviet influence. And then, you know, with, with the Chinese and then completely independent saying everybody out there is imperialist and we're the only true communist nation. Yeah, that's true. So by the time in which I was growing up in the 80s, we were completely isolated uh, and we considered ourselves to be the only country who was pursuing true socialism and the path to true communism in the world. And in fact, I watched recently an interview with an Ethiopian hardcore Marxist-Leninist group and uh, and so they were sort of guerrilla fighters in Ethiopia, and uh, they were asked, so who is your model country in the world for the kind of communism that you would like to realize? And they said, Albania. And I remember, and I saw this interview from this documentary, and the BBC journalist was asking them, Albania? Some people would say that's the most godforsaken country in the world. It's so isolated and so poor, and it's so horrible. And the, the Marxist-Leninist guerrilla fighter replied saying, Albania is not isolated. Albania has the admiration of a lot of Marxist-Leninist guerrilla movements in the world. And so that kind of confirmed from the outside the story that I had heard as a child, which was that even though we were the enemies of big empires, there were lots of small anti-imperialist groups scattered around the world that looked up to Albania as a model. Yeah, because I think you say in your book it was quite popular with leftist Swedes as well as a place to visit and and admire. Yeah, there were lots of these um, Marxist-Leninist sects scattered around, not just uh, in so in, in places like Africa or Asia or Latin America, but even in Western Europe. In fact, half of the tourists that we used to get in Albania were from Scandinavian countries, and they were from these uh, formerly Maoist, then had become Hojaist sects in Sweden or Norway or Denmark. And in fact, when I recently did my book tour with uh, my Danish translation. I met quite a few people who came to my book launch who confessed to having been Marxist-Leninists in the 80s who come to Albania with this big admiration that I remembered as a child. Wow. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it, it just seems such a long time ago, um, this history. But I think, you know, it, particularly with your book, it made me think of echoes of, you know, what what's happening today in in some countries as well um your mother was a national chess champion wasn't she mm -hmm. yeah she was yeah yeah she had uh, taken up chess um so she started maths at university and she'd taken up chess uh she came from a family of a uh, very large very rich for, well formerly rich property owners and who had been expropriated in the 40s, 50s, when the party came to power in Albania. And so she grew up in poverty, even though she came from this extremely rich family. And many of her and her siblings would, they, they picked up sports because being involved in sports, she told me, was a way of getting free suits and going for tournaments and you'd get some small subsidies. And so they were helped by these sport activities that they were pursuing. And so, yeah, so she took up and then and all of her and her siblings each had different talents and she discovered her talent was in chess. And so she pursued chess and, and was a national chess champion. Yeah. Wow. Well, and, and neither of your parents were big fans of the party. You know, your your grandfather was an important figure earlier in Albanian history, although you didn't know it when you were growing up. Yeah, that was my great grandfather. So. Um, so my father's grandfather was a former prime minister of Albania and the former founder of the Albanian Popular Party, which was the main conservative party, and was also um, had also been in the court and he'd been a very close ally of King Zog, who was in power in Albania in the 30s. Zog was a self-proclaimed king and he had good relationships with Italy and 
And then eventually there was an Italian occupation, so a kind of transfer of sovereignty. And my great-grandfather was responsible for actually signing these documents that transferred the sovereignty of Albania to these Italian occupiers, even though it was a kind of soft occupation because Italians were already present in the country with commercial activities. And so it was a first a kind of de facto colonization, which was then eventually formalized with a formal transfer of political power. But the country really had been colonized in all bad name before that. And so my great grandfather was a key figure in this transition, which meant that in Albanian history, he was a little bit like one of the equivalents of a Vichy government member, basically, something like a Marichal Pétain, let's say, as a collaborator. Mm. And he was in all the history books as a collaborator. And he was called, he had the same name and surname as my father. But during communism, I didn't know that he was actually a relative. And I had been told that it was a coincidence that he had the same name and surname as my dad. And uh, and we just didn't have anything to be ashamed of. And I remember I was very worried by this whole thing throughout my childhood that we didn't have, that we had this um, stain in our biography, I guess, that my dad had the same name and surname as this fascist, but also that we didn't really have communists in the family either. So we didn't have party members and uh, my parents weren't in the party either. We didn't have any war heroes to celebrate on the 5th of May in Albania. We used to commemorate heroes of the resistance. And in school, you were asked to bring um, evidence or some kind of memory or little objects that would remind and tell the teacher that your family had this contribution somehow through a relative or a grandfather or something like that to the war, to the Second World War. And we didn't have anyone. So I grew up sort of worrying that we didn't have anyone and also burdened by this association with his former prime minister, which I only discovered in 1990 was actually my great grandfather because my family hadn't told me anything about it. Now, you also have a history of dissidence with your grandfather on your mother's side, because with with Albania being an atheist country, obviously religion has been suppressed during the communist period. But in the 1990s, you discover that your Muslim, and there's a incredible story about uh, a walk that your parents used to take you on and and point out a particular window to you. Yeah, this was the um, the party headquarters, which my my mother always looked up, and then it turned up whenever she went past there. It turned up, and I and I had once overheard this conversation about she between her and my father about someone who had kind of said something from that window. And I only discovered again in 1990 that this building used to belong to my mother's family and that this building was where her grandfather had jumped out of in in the 40s sometime during a torture session to escape basically torture. And so he'd killed himself by jumping off this building. And he had shouted because he was a Muslim. He had shouted Allahu Akbar and uh, Allah is great in this kind of last minutes of of life or yeah and that this was one of the sort of family stories that's a really powerful story and i appreciate you sharing that with me um i understand that your grandfather on your father's side studied with enver hodger yeah so my grandfather was unlike his father not a conservative he was actually quite progressive and he'd studied law um in paris at the sorbonne and he had been active in the Popular Front. He wasn't a communist. He was a social democrat. But social democrat back in the 40s, I think, meant something much more radical than a social democrat now. And uh, and so he was in some ways a sort of leftist, uh, and uh, but not a communist, not a communist, a more sort of a Western leftist, let's say. And he had met Hoxha because they were both active in the Popular Front, although my grandfather was active in the Socialist Party and Hoxha was active in the Communist Party. But in the Popular Front, they were in the way, in the same sort of alliance. And he had also been campaigning against King Zog in the 40s and had brought anti-fascist brochures in Albania, even though his father was a minister. And so there was this conflict between my grandfather and his father. And they were on opposite ideological spectrum, let's say. So uh, I was, yeah, I also discovered this by coincidence, actually, when I was told that uh, my grandfather had been to 
the Popular Front, but somehow my family didn't indulge and he, they didn't tell me a lot about him. They used to say that he'd been to university and I knew that he'd done one stint at university in Paris, or I eventually discovered this in the late 80s. And then another part of his research was often mentioned, and uh, and it, as it was mentioned about many family relatives, that people would say such and such went to university or did research for a very long time. And I knew that my dad had grown up with his mother only for his first 18 years. Or, yeah, yeah, 18 years, because he couldn't remember his father. He basically, I was told his father, when my dad was three, had gone to do this long research at university, which took 15 years. And only in 1990, I discovered that what they meant when they said that someone had done research was that they had been to prison. And so my grandfather had gone to prison in 1946 and came out 15 years after. Yeah, because your your parents and the, the rest of the family were using this coded language in front of you, as you mentioned, with universities. And I think there was coded language about subjects and um, whether they dropped out, for example, or or other things. Can you just explain some of those other bits of the language that were being used? Yeah, they had this uh, very sophisticated code language, which they used to refer to prisons and political prisons, which they referred to as universities. And when they said someone gone to do research, what they meant is they'd gone to prison. And if they said someone had dropped out, it meant they had committed suicide. And if they said someone had stayed on to teach, it meant that they had stayed on and become a spy, basically. They had converted from being a political prisoner to being a, a collaborator of the regime. And then they had these different uh, ways of talking about different subjects. So if they said, for example, someone studied economics, it meant that they had been charged for hiding gold or for some kind of crime of an economic nature. It meant they were former property owners, for example. Or if they said they studied international relations, they were charged for treason and, uh, and and so on. So they had different uh, sort of elaborate language for all these different uh, kinds of charges that you'd go to prison for. And they're do- obviously doing this to protect you because at school you're being taught to be a good socialist citizen. Yeah, we had moral education classes in school and also in history and uh, in all the other, in, in all the humanities, really. Um, school was, the, the textbooks were obviously vehicles of state propaganda. And so you just get the party point of view and the point of view of Albanian communism, basically, in the textbooks. And so in um, the one that was really important to me was moral education because that's where you'd be told about what Albania meant and how it related itself to various other socialist states and where those socialist states had gone wrong or, you know, how, for example, the Soviet, what we call the Soviet revisionists, had betrayed the lessons of Stalin and had moved on to chart a path that was no longer the path of honorable socialism, let's say. And... uh and other things like that. So we were told about the history of Albania, the history of other countries, the politics of Albania, and the point of view of the Albanian Labour Party, so the Albanian Communist Party, that was a name, was Labour Party, and um, and how it related to other Marxist-Leninist parties around the world and other revisionist socialist parties around the world. Because you have this teacher, Nora. Did you just have one teacher who taught all subjects, or was she specific moral education? She was moral education. Um, So we had the same teacher for the first four years. And then when you move to secondary school, which was the first year of secondary school, I did half in socialism and half in liberalism, as it were. And and so that's when we were still having moral education class. And so these were the last conversations I remembered with her, in particular, where things were beginning to change in Albania a little bit. And she was a party member and she was a committed communism. And... um, and so I remember, especially towards the end, when I began to have doubts about what was going on and about these protests, which the state television didn't call protests, they called them hooligans. Um, sometimes I'd go to her and ask her. And so these were the conversations that I reconstruct in the book were very much the conversations with her that happened during this last year before things changed dramatically. And I think it's it's worth noting that for Albania, the end of communism came a year after or virtually a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah, exactly, because Albania had been um, cut off from the rest of the uh, socialist states in Europe. So they had broken with, uh, well, they'd broken with Yugoslavia in the 40s, as we mentioned, they'd broken with the Soviet Union in the 50s. 
And they had also left the Warsaw Pact in 1968 when the Soviet Union invaded Prague. And so, and then by the time in which I was growing up, the propaganda on the newspapers, for example, or on the party media and on the state controlled media was always this propaganda of, you know, there is revisionist socialist states in Europe and Albania is something completely different. And it's different from Yugoslavia. It's different from the Soviet Union. It's different from the satellite states of the Soviet Union, which meant that when the Berlin Wall fell, it felt as though these events didn't really affect Albania because we'd never really been part or the last 20 years hadn't really been sharing this history of other states under socialism. And so it felt as though things could happen and Albania was so isolated that it would be untouched by these other European events. The only one that I remember that uh, I have this sort of vague memory of my parents discussing it and, and, and sort of thinking maybe things are going to change in Albania as well was actually the killing of Ceausescu in Romania. And in part, I think, because of the way in which it happened, that there was a sort of mob and there was a killing of a leader, in part because there was a sense that Romania, at least to my parents' minds, as they explained it later, Romanian socialism and Ceausescu was in some ways more similar to Albania in its harshness than other Soviet satellite states. And uh, and that Ceausescu was a bit more similar to Enver Hoxha. And there was this whole thing between Ceausescu and his wife, Elena, who was considered to be uh, an accomplice of his. And there was a slightly similar dynamic in Albania between Hoxha and his wife, Nedmia, who was also seen as a kind of Elena Ceausescu figure who stood was behind sort of um, almost like a Macbethian figure. Yeah, yeah. They both sort of shared that cult of personality. So it was only when things changed in Romania that I think... So, so the Berlin Wall was really not something that they thought about much as potentially affecting Albania. But I think the circumstances of the killing of Ceausescu was something that made them, at least as they explained it to me afterwards, think maybe uh, it might change in Albania too. And it did, but it did about a year after uh, compared to the rest of um, Eastern Europe, yeah. Now, we've mentioned Enver Hoxha quite a lot. Now, Enver Hoxha was the lead, the communist leader of Albania from the end of World War II until the 80s. So he had been active in the, re in the resistance, uh, and he'd been one of the founders of the Albanian Communist Party in 41, and then active in the resistance against the fascists and the Nazis. And then uh, in 1946, the communists won the elections, and... Uh, other there were other independent candidates which were purged pretty quickly after and so he basically was then solely in charge of political power in albania from 46 to 1985 which is when he died yeah i'm impressed you remember all those dates is that down to your education with nora yeah i mean in <laughs> albania you would know about you know the founding of albanian communist party and uh... you just rattled them off there like uh you know you've been told them yesterday i mean i'm I'm seriously impressed by that memory there. Um, so do you remember the death of Enver Hoxha? Yeah, actually, every child in Albania remembers it. I was only about uh, five and a half, but I was recently talking to friends about my book and they everyone has their own story of what where they were that day, what they were doing, what happened. I was at nursery and I remember being told at nursery. And, and also, I think five and a half is the kind of age where children start thinking about death and Albania was an atheist country we didn't have uh, religion was banned basically was banned in the late 60s early 70s maybe in the 70s and so I grew up in this kind of self-proclaimed atheist state and the stories about death was that you know it was evolution and material reality. And when you die, you're just dead. And the only thing that survives is your work and the legacy that you leave behind. But there was no sense of the, you know, another world or uh, paradise or hell or whatever, all these things. They were just considered to be dogma and superstition for backward people. And religion was considered to be the kind of opium of the people. So I remember that when Hoja died and we were told at nursery I remember thinking, I remember this vague conversations about death with friends. And then I also remember going home and my grandmother didn't seem upset. And she kept, she'd made direct that day, it's kind of pie that people make in, in Albania and the Balkans. And she kept saying, look, I've made this burek, it's so nice, you should have it. And I wasn't hungry because I felt like I was mourning and I had a kind of duty to mourn. So I was like, I'm not hungry. How can you be hungry in such, on such a sad day? 
And I remember my grandmother saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I only tried it a little bit. I'm also not hungry. I'm also very sad. <laughs> and But this was the first time in which it dawned on me that maybe my family wasn't as upset about the death of Enver Hoxha as I was. And I also remember a couple of days after the funeral was shown on state television. And the other thing that I noticed from that time and what made me think that maybe I was more of a committed communist than my parents ever were was the... The fact that I was devastated and there were these images on television of people crying, women um, pulling their hair and crowds of soldiers looking really devastated and, and there was a funeral march. And I remember very clearly that my parents were talking about the funeral march and who had composed the music. And again, this seemed to me at the time to be completely outrageous. Like, how can you think about music? Also because in Albania, when someone dies, we have this long morning and, you know, you don't watch television, you don't listen to music, you're dressed all in black and you're very serious. And and so I remember thinking, how can they be having this fight about who's made the music? And my mother was saying it was Beethoven and my dad was saying, no, it was an Albanian composer. And um, so I have this very vivid memory of, of the death of Hoxha. But I also, I was talking to a friend recently and she was reconstructing this story of how she had asked her mother, why are you not crying? And her mother said, oh, I already cried at work. And so she remembered as well that there was this kind of gap between her understanding of the death and her family's assessment of the death. So clearly for a lot of children from a, from a certain kind of Albanian family, the death of Hoxha was one of these moments where you sort of think there's something strange about my family that you're not quite able to grasp, but it singles them out somehow. You knew that you were different at school because your your grandmother taught you French. Why was that? Yeah, I um, so French was my first language. I grew up speaking it, and it, uh, when I went to nursery, I was that's when I started to really learn Albanian. She came from uh, my my grandmother was born in Salonica, which was a very cosmopolitan city in time where she was born and uh, she had gone to a French lycée and she came from this aristocratic family where French was a kind of lingua franca as it was for a lot of aristocratic families at the turn of the century between the 19th and 20th century and even before that. So it was only in 1990 that I discovered that for my grandmother speaking French to me was a way of preserving her identity and in some ways also afterwards making me realize that I was somehow different from other children in Albania but without quite telling me how and why I stood out it was a way for her to kind of imprint her family background and her identity and her history into me as a child by speaking this language that I didn't understand why I had to speak and she spoke with a with an accent she didn't have any relatives in France uh, she'd never been to France and so for me, I remember it was very perplexing why I had to speak French. And I was always told when I asked them that, oh, it was a nice language and it was a language <laughs> of the French Revolution and, and my grandfather had studied in France. And so I was given all these reasons, but none of them eventually dawned on me in 1990 that none of them was the real reason, which was that uh, she basically for her, it was an identity marker. And, uh, and it was a way of keeping alive, I guess, her connection to her past, which she had to forget when she came to Albania. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, you get to learn about how tough her life had been from you know the the end of World War Two onwards, with um, her going from a very gilded life of servants and you know luxury to uh, almost the complete opposite, or more than the complete opposite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was. I mean, she came from this extremely privileged background and also wealthy and surrounded by. Um, by, by honors and titles and so on. And then she'd married my grandfather when she came to Albania. She was working. She was the first woman to work in the Albanian administration. She was a secretary of the prime minister during the period of King Zog. So in the 30s. Mm. And, uh, and she had come to Albania to work. Otherwise, her family was in Salonika. And in fact, her dad, her father died away from her. She could never see him after the end of the war. Um, she only learned about his death with a telegram and she didn't know exactly under what circumstances he died because the family was completely divided. Half of it was in, in Greece and had stayed in Greece and some of the part who had come to Albania had either migrated in the 40s when people could leave because they realized that things were changing. And in her case, she was also given the option of uh, emigrating with the help of British soldiers who were in Albania during the Second World War. 
but her mother was in Albania and she was looking after her and had cancer. And so they, they were basically stuck. And after that, very quickly, my grandfather went to prison and he was charged with agitation and propaganda in part as a result of these connections with the British soldiers. And uh, so he went to prison and then she was deported and was in charge of my father and was working in the fields and cleaning, you know, she basically she was making having the life of someone who had gone from being a privileged class to being a class enemy. Now, Leia, there's a lovely story in your book of you using your French when you bump into some uh, French school children who are on holiday in Albania. There were two bits so one is about the tourists and uh they were they were one of well these tourists that came to albania and that came to albania because it was an exotic country that was cut off from the rest of the world and they were curious to see either how great albanian socialism was or how miserable it was depending on the point of view and uh, i remember i was in this excursion with my mother's school in the island of leja and at some point, there was a group of tourists on a tourist bus, and I was crossing the road, and they called me and said, uh, attention, in French. And so I answered back instinctively, because I, you know, remembered my grandfather saying, my, my grandmother saying, attention. And so I was sort of, without thinking, answered back. And they were extremely surprised that there was this child in isolated Albania that could speak fluent French. And uh, But we were told when we were little in school never to talk to tourists. And often tourists came with sweets or chewing gum to offer us. And we were told by especially our moral education teacher to be aware of them because they were corrupting devices and they wanted things from us or they wanted to take photos of us and do bad things and so on. So I was extremely cautious. So I remember I didn't accept. I talked to them for a little bit and I didn't accept the the sweets or the wrappers and uh, they eventually gave me this postcard of Paris with the Eiffel Tower on it and uh, which I took home and this is actually that was the time in which I discovered about my grandfather who had been to Paris and the fact that we had another postcard with an Eiffel Tower and so on and but I wouldn't really um, you know I, I wasn't re- replying enthusiastically to them but to show them that I understood what they were saying I started singing this bit from the Miserable, the Gavroche song, (laughs) the bit where he says, I was, uh, you know, it's the fault of Voltaire and it's the fault of Rousseau if I'm here today. And and so fighting. And they were extremely surprised that, again, there was a child in Albania who knew about Voltaire and Rousseau and the Miserable and could speak in French and could recite bits from the Miserable in French. So that was my encounter with the French tourists. Your father uh, had a nickname for you, Gavroche, as well, didn't he? We used to talk about the Miserable a lot, actually, in part also because we had the puppet show. We had bits of uh, the Miserable shown as a puppet show in Albania. And so we had Cosette, which I had grown up with, this puppet show called Cosette, which uh, was taken, was an adaptation, children's adaptation from the Miserable. And, uh, and, and in addition to that, yeah, it was part of the family history. There's some great stories in this book and I, I love that the detail you go into because you talk about you know the the foreign tourists coming to Albania and you talk about the smell of the sun cream because the tourists were always isolated from the locals and they were always monitored there was always a tour guide with them that would show around Albania and would show them factories or you know schools or I don't know tourist attractions historical elements of the country but they were always basically accompanied they were never uh, the tourists were not independent once they came to albania they were part of the group they would you'd never see a single tourist you always saw a group of tourists and also at the beach uh as i lived in the seaside town and there was a, a stretch of the beach that was devoted to the tourist hotel where the the tourist hotel was completely separated from the part where the Albanians would go for sunbathing and would go for their beach activities. But I remember, and there was a sort of trench in the sand that separated the area where the tourists would sunbathe and the area where the Albanians would go. And you were not allowed as an Albanian to be in the tourist area. But as a child, in the water, there was no trench. And so in the water, you could actually swim close to them. And one of the most vivid memories of my childhood is this smell of sun cream that became really strong when you went into the tourist area because we didn't have sun cream in Albania. It didn't exist. And so there was this really weird smell. 
that once you moved out of the locals zone into the foreigners zone became really striking and completely weird. It was almost like you went to a different country. And the children were very curious and so would kind of follow the tourists and follow them so they could follow the smell. Or if they could smell the smell, they knew that there were tourists around. <laughs> and they had the tourist children had different toys as well because they brought things with them from, from abroad. And so they had this kind of splashing toys and with splashing colors and, yeah, with characters that we didn't know, like Mickey Mouse or whatever. We didn't have all these Disney characters in Albania. So they looked very striking as well. And it was my grandmother who told me about the smell, that it was sun cream. I didn't know what it was, but I just remember telling her, like, what is this smell? And she said, that's sun cream. We don't have it, but we have olive oil, which is much healthier. And, <laughs> and from then on, I had a name for the smell of the tourists. Yeah, yeah. because although Albania was was very isolated during this period, you could, where, where you lived, you could pick up Italian TV, couldn't you? Yeah, um, and also in the capital, there were different ways in which you could pick the signal. In in the coast where I was, there was a way that came via the mountain, which was Mount Daiti, that was in Tirana, and there was, I think, a satellite or something up there, and that was called the, that was the Daiti signal. And the problem, with, the only problem with the Daiti signal is that it was somehow I don't I still haven't figured out what exactly the mechanics of how that signal worked were, but basically it was kind of there and reliable until it was time for the news, eight o'clock news or, you know, the one o'clock news. And then it got completely cut off. So there was a sense in which I think it was tolerated somehow. But then when the news came, it was completely impossible to pick it. And so that, that, that the signal was just cut. But the other source that we had, if you were by the sea, there was this direct signal from the Adriatic Sea because you were close to Italy. And that one was very different because that one had that that could be received with the fiddling with the antenna so you had these homemade antennas that people would put up on their roofs and most of my childhood i remember these struggles of my dad and the antenna in the summer because he'd go up on the roof and he'd move the antenna around and he'd shout across the window how's the signal is it good and i say no lots of spider webs and then he kind of kept fiddling what about now and i'd say no no it's even worse so this is how we picked um, international news, I guess, and international programs and sometimes music, sometimes culture or cultural programs through this um, influence of Italian television. Yeah, because you, you described the first time you saw the Pope. Yeah, that was I, did, I only saw him a little bit. It was This was in the Daiti through this mountain signal, which would be cut during the, the news. So basically the thing with the Daiti was that it was quite good, but it went very abruptly. And the other one was more reliable, but in terms of not being cut, but because it depended on the weather and the antenna, it could be worse or better, depending on whether it was nice weather or whether it was windy or rainy or whatever. And I remember the Pope is, um, was very striking because if you've never seen the Pope, he looks really weird. It's this man all dressed in white with his funny hat. And um, I, didn't, I didn't know what the Pope was or what he was there for and what he was doing but I only remember a glimpse of him in the television and then the signal went because it was the news and the news had just started and the first item was the Pope so that's how I remember him and actually again recently talking to a friend about this he said to me I remember that I think I remember seeing the Pope in this exact way I saw him for a glimpse and then he disappeared and I was just left with this mystery of what is this man dressed in white doing and what what is he and why is he there brilliant Brilliant. Now, you've also, you've got some neighbours, Michal and Danica, who are party members. How how does that relationship work with, with your parents? Well, they were our closest neighbours. And so they were, op- they lived opposite us. But I think they were in a relationship of trust with my parents. And so Mihal was someone that they would turn to if there was a problem with the local party office or uh, sometimes, you know, we had this kind of council like democracy where people uh, or sort of council system, let's say, because it wasn't quite democracy. But there was this council system, which was, I guess, participation from below with all the neighborhood going and taking decisions about the neighborhood and about cleaning the neighborhood on Saturdays and so on. So there were all these collective activities that neighbors were part of. And I remember once, for example, there had been a complaint by another neighbor who'd said that my parents weren't cleaning with sufficient enthusiasm (laughs) on Sundays. And this for them was really devastating because they already had a kind of black mark on their biographies because they came from these dissident families and everybody knew, except for me. But if somebody said something like that, that you weren't enthusiastic, you could be in trouble with the local party office. 
And so I remember that this neighbor of ours with whom my parents had a good relationship of trust was um, defending them and protecting them somehow in these cases and was someone we would turn to if we had issues with the party or if we were worried, if my parents were worried that um, something might happen to them or someone might be reporting on them or if they needed to somehow know who was keeping an eye on them. So it was this... um, strange relationship whereby on the one hand they were in the party but because the Mihal was a sort of nice honest man and somehow he respected my parents and they got on very well he was also keeping an eye on us and watching us yeah yeah but there's a bit of a bust up over a coke can though that was the only time in which they um that they had a kind of falling out because my mother had bought in um her school where he worked where she worked secondhand a coke can from a colleague an empty can that is because these were at the time very prized possessions people would put them on their bookshelves and would show them as um you know symbol symbols of western um commercial i guess something and uh, and so and and my mom had bought this secondhand coke can from a neighbor but the coke can disappeared from our shelf and then day after it appeared on top of Mihal's television and so my mother suspected that his wife had taken it from her. And so there was a fight between them. Uh, it turned out she had not taken it. But uh, that was the only time in which they fell out. And uh, I was very upset because I used to spend a lot of time in their garden. And I was very close to them. And I was really sad to see them um, fight over this Coca-Cola can, basically. And it was the only thing they could fight on, in a way. It was the only thing that would trigger a fallout. Otherwise, they had a key to our house if if we needed money from them, we'd ask them for money. If they needed me to be looked after by them, they would ask them. I would kind of go, we would go in and out all the time and call each other for coffee and have meals together and so on. So it was very weird when this whole thing happened because of the Coke can, because otherwise, as I say, there was a, a relationship of complete trust and solidarity. The latter part of 1990, you start to notice changes. There's demonstrations, small demonstrations starting and then the 12th of december the communist party announced they're going to allow the state to become a multi-party state and where do you hear that do you actually see that announcement on tv with your parents yes that was on television the secretary of the party came out and he announced that uh, political pluralism wouldn't be punished anymore it was a punishable offense and that we would have free elections And this is also something that is in my diary. So I remember when these, when these demonstrations started, when these changes started, I started keeping a diary, perhaps as a way of making sense of what was going on around me. And in part also because I was given all this conflicting information and I wasn't sure where the truth was and who to believe and what to listen for. And, you know, were they hooligans? Were they protesters? These different categories with which different sources made sense of reality so i started keeping a diary and this part in the book is more or less speaking up exactly the discussion that i have in the diary where i say we saw the secretary of the party on television and he talked about political pluralism no longer being punishable and having free elections and i remember thinking well elections we've always had elections we we, we did have elections and people would vote in in the communist period they'd go to vote really really early so my parents would go to queue for the election. And I remember I always wanted to go because there was all these uh, programs on television about children who could go and bring flowers and sing a song or recite a poem. And since I was very devoted socialist child, I always wanted to go really early with my parents. And, and so I actually remember participating in these elections and thinking that elections were always free because they were given a list and people uh, put this list in a box. And so the rituals of an election were actually similar in a way. And again, it was one of these things that my parents had to explain to me that there had been only one party and you couldn't really, you didn't really have a choice of not going for the election or not turning up or, you know, not voting for the candidates of the front. It was called the front, uh, the list of candidates that you were given. And uh, that now it would be different because there would be different political parties, each with their own message and each with their own program. And I also remember talking to friends about what do political parties decide when there are free elections? And if they have different programs, what do they actually say? So to what extent, how far does their message stretch? Can they question, you know, Christmas and New Year's Eve? Because I remember we also had rediscovered religion. So we were also told that we were no longer an atheist state, but now we could have lots of different religions. And so I remember this uh, 
association between different parties and political pluralism on the one hand and different religions also being available on the other hand. And so wondering whether all would these different parties basically vote about which ele- which religion was the right one and this kind of confusion around how religion related to political messages from from different parties. Yeah, it must have been a really unsettling time for you because your parents are... Well, you realise that your parents have effectively been concealing masses of information from you, that they were never fans of communism either, which was sort of, you know, you were sort of getting that 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 vibe anyway. But to to have that level of upheaval at that age must have been really challenging for you. I mean, I remember it as being really confusing. I don't remember it as being traumatic in a sort of damaging way as in I don't remember being and I also don't get from my diaries when I reread them I don't get the sense that I felt this was a tragedy or this was really sad or it was more that there was a sense of complete confusion that comes across as in the world was like this and now it's like this and now we need to adapt to these new things so there will be lots of parties and there's no more communism now we have liberalism and so all these categories that were just basically being replaced overnight and you used to think one way and now you have to think another way. And you used to be one person or you thought you were one person and you discover that you came from this family and you got to actually never be the person that you thought you would be because I always thought that I had a bright future in communist Albania until my parents told me that I would never have a bright future in communist Albania because of the family I came from and because of the way in which biography shaped people's fate and decisions throughout their lives. And so they said, you know, there would come a point where as a adult or as a teenager you would discover the truth that we have now told you because of circumstances changing but you would find out for yourself eventually that you came from this family and that these were uh, this was the reality in which you would grow up and that would also constrain you know what you would study or what options you could pursue you'd never be able to be a party member for example and um, so all of these things I remember them being very confusing but I guess because I trusted my parents and I trusted especially my grandmother, I eventually took it all in my stride. And so I feel in the diaries when I reread them, I did adapt pretty quickly, actually. Um, I don't know what that did to my identity in the long run. And I guess the maybe the long, the more long lasting legacy of that whole transition has really been this sense of disbelief in any ideological categories. There's a sense in which you discover that the world always comes packed with an interpretation and you can never quite fully trust the interpretation that you're given because, you know, it's somehow part of the society you live in and of the history you're part of and of, you know, the characters that you relate to. And once you make that discovery that there is always an ideological package for everything, then I guess you become inherently skeptical and and it becomes very hard to believe in anything, actually. So I'd say maybe that's the more, um, if I were to think of what the consequences of finding of that discovery have been for me in my life it's more been it's been more this sense of disbelief in anything that you're told and this idea that you need to kind of exercise your own judgment and try and be critical and have critical scrutiny for everything because you can't ever trust anyone fully no no i don't you know it's it's certainly a period of upheaval for Albania because you talk about people who were formerly bus drivers with other jobs that you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be um, to be doing in that early 90s period in, in Albania. Yeah, I mean, there were all these people who had these jobs in state enterprises, which uh, had to close eventually because of the transition to a market economy and the need to save costs for state enterprises and to modernize. And so this was also the time in which, as I say, lots of enterprises closed down, lots of people tried to leave the country and there was lots of poverty, massive inequality, and then the rise of all kinds of jobs and traffics that people were picking up as ways of survival, really. And some of them were obviously more damaging for others. Others were more damaging for oneself. And, uh, but there was a sense in which they were all discussed with the same sense of cold assessment of the necessities that people had to go through to just survive. And so this is where people would say, well, such and such used to be a bus driver, but now he exports cocaine to Switzerland. And they were both mentioned as though they were equivalent jobs. And with this, as I say, with sense of uh, 
suspending judgment around the morality of the occupation that they had taken because the idea was that under these circumstances, there wasn't a lot of choice that you could exercise anyway. So you basically just did whatever you could to keep going in a way. And you either, you know, survived or you didn't survive. But I think the understanding from everyone was that everyone had to do what they could. Yeah. Yeah. You tell a sad story of a friend of yours who sort of like disappears one day and you keep waiting for her to come back and you hear about where she's gone and also how she ends up there. Yeah, she's um, um, she was someone who had, in a way, sort of shared the same childhood as me. But then she also had a tragedy because her mother died in childbirth and uh, she had a father who was an alcoholic and um, and eventually with this whole transition, somehow things started going wrong for her and she went to Italy when she was still a uh, minor with this boy that, that she'd fallen in love with, who I knew because he was in my neighborhood and he was a bully. And then eventually at the end of the book, it's discovered that she was, she became basically a victim of sex trafficking. And, um, and this is not a unique story in a way. I mean, there were lots of, uh, again, this was one other in the nineties, there was this huge increase in, in sex trafficking and, and prostitution and so on. And she was someone who ended up a victim of this transition for circumstances that she couldn't really control. Yeah, I think it, it illustrates really well the sort of, I mean, we've talked about transitions, but it's like, it's a massive upheaval and a massive change and people really not knowing what to do for the best because they've been so used to being sort of looked after by the state and now they're having to fend for themselves and learned new ways of working and also they're vulnerable to being defrauded which is really what happens further into the the 90s with these pyramid schemes yeah exactly i mean that was very much the result also of having a very underdeveloped financial sector which coupled with this new capitalist ethos which is that you must invest and save money and that capitalism works by this logic of if you invest and save or save and invest whichever way the cycle starts then you'll make you'll become rich and that all you need to do is to basically make sure you make sound investments and so there are all these financial companies that emerged uh, out of nowhere really which were promising extremely high returns for investments to people and where at one point two-third of Albania had placed their savings and some people because they were giving these extortionate returns some people were even selling their houses to make money and take the money and then invest it and so that's how um and this and these were all Ponzi schemes or pyramid schemes which worked for for a while and then eventually became insolvent as they did in uh, 97 which caused then a massive upheaval and people um getting really angry with the government because the government hadn't guaranteed these mechanisms or hadn't really guaranteed the financial sector and hadn't really intervened and it was all part of this kind of new capitalist ethos that you would just laissez faire and and that people would just do whatever they could and in 97, this led to something close to civil war because, uh, as I say, the country became insolvent. Insolvent, the whole, every, everybody had lost something. My family lost their savings, but at least they hadn't sold their house. But there were other families that had actually sold their houses and were completely without anything. And so people were getting very angry and started looting. And, um, and very quickly, the country descended into this complete chaos where uh, the state wasn't able to guarantee even basic law and order anymore. And uh, there are rival bands fighting and, uh, you know, this kind of scenario where you just have a state of nature and whoever has more guns controls basically everything. And, um, yeah, this was the year in which I completed my A-levels. And now you're teaching political theory, including... Marxism, Leninism as as part of the the syllabus. I mean, you you must be pretty unique in terms of teaching it and also having experience of of both systems. I mean, do your your students, I presume, are very much aware that you've you've lived under both? Actually, no, because I never really brought it up, and I have also never really uh, asked myself why I was doing it until I was my mum confronted me with this question 
at one point I had, uh, so I had started doing political, I started studying philosophy and then from philosophy, I moved on to political philosophy and political theory. And then I was doing political ideologies and institutions and so on. And I became more and more interested in Marx and Marxism. And in a way, it was only really writing this book that I fully realized why I, why I was drawn to this. Because I had always approached Marxism as a set of ideas and thinking about socialism and thinking about conceptions of freedom. I was always interested in these conceptions of freedom. In fact, this is a kind of free history of free of this book is a book that was going to be an academic book on, on ideas of freedom in the liberal and socialist traditions. But at one point, I was researching and writing articles on Marx. And my mom actually put this question to me saying, well, you know, people ask me, how come your daughter is teaching Marx after all that Albania has lived through? and it was partly as an attempt to answer that question that I actually wrote the book to try and explain, you know, how do you get to being curious about your own life and about your own choices, theoretical and political, coming from a background like mine. And in a way, I saw it as really a, a kind of rescuing of the family roots, of the family history, and coming to terms with this legacy in my family, which was a kind of bloody legacy on the one hand, but then on the other hand, this disaffection with liberalism and capitalism that I had experienced myself. And I guess the book was really a kind of uh, an attempt to come to terms, I guess, with all these difficult choices, but also with this messy history of the family and of the country. And yeah, I ended the book by saying that I wanted it to be, a, a, you know, I had thought of it as a, as a philosophical book. But then when I started thinking about ideas and personal histories, the ideals became really connected to this uh, weird and messy and, and bloody history of the family and that this is why the book ended up being what it is and why the book really is a book about freedom and the kind of search for freedom in different systems that needs to come out of confronting the histories of these different systems and their failures as systems that affect the lives of individuals. The book is called Free, Coming of Age at the End of History by Leia Ippi, and it's published by Alan Lane. It certainly gets the Cold War conversation seal of approval, and there will be links in the episode notes for you to buy the book. If you buy the book through those links, it will support the podcast, so I'd really appreciate that. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.